Here comes the, here comes the, here comes the, y'all don't really worry like that. Yeah. Here comes the, no. here comes the, oh. here comes the, y'all don't really worry like that. Yeah. This podcast is brought to you in association with Recovery, the natural choice for rugby recovery. You're sore, you're low on gas, and life has a habit of getting in the way when it comes to doing all those little extras that you need to do to recover properly. Going into game day knowing your body's in the best condition possible is the goal. Your next performance depends on it. Well, Recovery has you covered. Recovery is reinventing rugby recovery. Check out their range of all natural products with prices that range from as little as £7 to be budget friendly for all shoppers. You can find them on Instagram at recovery or head to recovery.com or simply click the link in the description to take you straight to their website. For an extra bonus, if you use the code DROPGOAL in all capitals, you'll receive a brilliant 10% off discount on all of your purchases. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Drop Goal Podcast. On today's episode of the podcast, we have an Italian international. Uh, he played for the Newcastle Knights and Hull KR most noticeably in his career, as well as playing multiple times internationally at top level in the World Cup. Uh, it's none other than Josh Man- Mantellato, mate. Welcome to the podcast. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. And um, yeah, happy to be joining the podcast. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to interview you today uh, and hopefully um, me and everyone listening will get to know a little bit about you uh, and your times involved uh, in rugby rugby league if you don't already. Uh, so we'll jump straight into it. Uh, you grew up in Australia, uh, being born in the Gosford area, I believe, uh, and obviously rugby league is a big part of the Aussie culture. Uh, so tell me, yeah. what was it like growing up uh, in New South Wales, constantly in the sun, around sports? And like, What was that like? Um, for me personally, it was great. Um, I grew up out on property. Okay. So we had, you know, acres of land, horses, all that kind of stuff. Mm. So for a, a young young boy with a football in his hand, it was always, um, you know, good fun to, to get home from school and go out in the paddock and, um, you know, kick the ball around and um, you know, invite over my mates. Yeah, um, yeah from school as well and um yeah growing up in that sort of environment really helped um with my love of the game and mm. you know I, I ended up building goal posts out in the paddock and that's where i practiced my goal kicking when i was a yeah. kid and yeah um yeah it, it was it was the best childhood ever really yeah it's uh it's definitely a, a dream of mine to uh, if I have kids when I'm older, uh, maybe grow up in Australia because it's a, a brilliant place, especially if you want to be involved in uh, sports and stuff because obviously the weather's uh, a, a lot of the time brilliant. Um, but you did just mention uh, before we started the podcast that it's quite cold and uh, wet today. What's the weather like in Australia at the moment, mate? Yeah, it's um, it's very, it's probably been one of the coldest weeks this right. year. Um, this weekend has been terribly wet. Um, I'm just coming off two weeks holidays, uh, for school holidays because I'm a teacher now. So yeah, um, but um, we're also in lockdown. Um, you know, we've had some pretty bad COVID cases yeah. lately, so yeah. the government's locked us all in. So it's been a pretty ordinary couple of weeks, but um, I can't wait till winter and this lockdown is over. Actually, yeah, me. Uh, it's, I think that's something everyone's uh, looking forward to. Just get get um the lockdowns and all the coronavirus just over and done with so we can uh return back to normal uh it's definitely yeah, something exactly. everyone's looking forward to yeah um so like i mentioned uh and everyone else listening will know contact sport is a big part of aussie culture uh where it's rugby union uh rugby league or even the afl uh but when was it that rugby league came into your life or were you more fond of union growing up or was AFL something you're interested to? When was it that league really took place in, in your life? Um, from memory, I was always uh, in love with rugby league. I had no mm. interest in union, no interest in AFL. Um, <clears throat> rugby league was always on the TV on a Friday night, yeah. on a Sunday afternoon. And it was something that I started playing when I was about nine, mm. like officially with a junior club. Um, you know, but before then you muck around at school with the football or whatever. Yeah. So it's always been a big, big thing for me. I, I can honestly say I had no other interest in any other sport 
except for right. rugby league. So, um, you know, those other football codes are big here in Australia and um, it can take some of your attention away for yeah. a lot of other kids. But uh, for me, it was just one sport and that was rugby league. Yeah, the best sport of them all, mate. That's uh, that's a definite. Um, yeah. So everyone who knows you or knows of you uh, know, is aware that you're practically a giant. You're about six foot five, uh, which compared to me is practically in the clouds, mate, if I'm being honest. Um, so were you always a, uh, tall as a lad or did you just shoot up um, one day or around like, a, was there a time where you just shot up or were you always tall? Yeah, I, um, growing up, like especially in my early teens, mm. I was very skinny, very probably on the lower end of the average height. So yeah. I'd play five eighth or hooker, yeah, dummy half. Um, and then one summer, I shot up a few inches. Okay, like about up to you know went from like five nine up to six three. Yeah, over one summer. Yeah, and that's when I started playing fullback, um, center out in the outside backs a bit more. And mm. um, yeah, that happened when I was about 15, 16. Right. Okay. And, you know, I was really tall when I was 16, yeah. 17, um, you know, six foot three, six foot four, but only about 75 kilo. So right. it took me a long time to put on, yeah. Some, yeah. To put on some muscle, put on some weight because naturally I'm not a very broad muscular mm. sort of frame. Yeah. Um, you know, I had to work hard and, eat a lot to, to put some muscle on yeah yeah um so obviously uh, i've got to quickly ask before we go any further it's the uh, euros final this weekend uh, england versus italy uh, you represented <laughs> italy internationally uh, you've lived in england for two years or so uh, so who are you supporting in the final and most importantly is it coming home to england oh <sighs> rocking a hard place here um, <laughs> I'd have to go for Italy, of right. course. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, if it was against anybody else, I would be barracking for England for yeah. sure because I know yeah. how passionate um, the English are with their football. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a cracking final. Yeah, it's definitely. It's going to be an absolute beast. So looking forward to it, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's going to be a very good game. Um, so obviously growing up, like I did mention a few times, uh, rugby league, uh, has been a big part of your life growing up. Um, uh, where did you play your junior rugby league and at what age did you really start getting into the groove of things and like, uh, really start to think, right, this is where I could actually make it as a rugby league player. I, um, I played with the Wyom Kangaroos. Yeah. Um, in my junior club, I, Started there when I was nine okay. and I left playing with them at the age of 24 mm. to go to play with Newcastle. So yeah, yeah, it was, it was never really a, um, a thing in my head that I could like make it yeah. at a professional level. Um, when I was 24, I just decided to, uh, give, um, the NRL reserve grade competition a crack, which mm -hmm. is New South Wales Cup. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd achieved everything I could in local uh, rugby league. Yeah. All the rep teams, all that sort of stuff. And um, that sort of gave me the confidence to say, yeah, I'm, I'll give this New South Wales competition a go and yeah. see how, how it pans out. And um, it wasn't until then that I thought, well, maybe I could mm. um, crack it. And, yeah, see how I go. Yeah, definitely, mate. Um, so you made your first international date uh, for Italy in around 2010, uh, which, I, uh, which I believe is actually quite early on in your career, um, yeah. considering you didn't really make your de professional debut until quite a lot later on than most players would. Uh, yeah. What made you choose Italy uh, and what, what member of your family made you eligible to represent Italy uh, internationally? Yeah, so in 2010, um, the Italian national team were having a a test match against Wales over in Wales. Okay. And they were, they were looking for players with uh, Italian heritage. And I qualified through my, my grandfather, right. my grandparents, I should say. Yeah. So my, both of my dad's parents are Italian. Okay. Um, okay. So I, I got a 
tap on the shoulder, essentially, uh, late 2010. Yeah. Um, if I was interested to, to play, and it was kind of a bit of a decision because you were going overseas for four weeks, mm. had to leave work for that four-week period. Yeah, um, yeah. But in the end, it was a bit of a no-brainer because yeah. that tour was one of the best tours I've ever been yeah. on. Um, yeah, yeah. Got to meet so many great players and uh, we played Wales in Wales and we beat them. And, yeah. Um, you know, it was, it was a great experience and that sort of, that was another reason for the uh, reason why I, the next year I moved off to Newcastle because I knew there was more chances of, you know, World Cups and stuff yeah. like that to come yeah. along and the opportunities would be a little bit more tougher to come by, especially mm. with, NRL players who are eligible. Yeah. So that sort of kicks out in my professional career in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed, mate. Um, so in 2012 or around that period, uh, like you mentioned, you joined the Newcastle Knights uh, and represented yeah. the club team. Uh, you finished the season as the competition's highest uh, point scorer with 306 points, uh, which is quite a big number. Uh, at this yeah. point in your career, you were clearly exceeding and were one of the best players in the club team, even though it was one of your first um, first seasons. Uh, at this yeah. point, do you think you uh, were ready to take that step up uh, into the world of the NRL, or did you think you needed maybe a little bit more time to adapt to the club team and then uh, get a bit more experience in the game and stuff like that? Yeah. Um, that, that first year of Cup at the Knights, I, um, I was 25. Yeah. Um, very comfortable with pretty much the way I was going as a player. Mm. I had all the support I needed around me as well. Okay. Um, a great coach, great assistant coaches. So I could yeah. always go to them for help. Um, they would always come to me with any um, constructive criticism that I could work on my game and that sort of stuff. I, I really savored that. Um, yeah. yeah. Always wanting to learn better myself as a player. Um, having that full 12 months under my belt really helped with um, my confidence and probably telling me that, yeah, I guess I could have a taste of that next level now. Um, it was good that I didn't get that until the following year. Yeah. And, but yeah, just that 12 months, I learned so much. It, it's such a different environment being in mm. an actual um NRL club system yeah compared to just playing local yeah rugby league um you know lots of little things that you need to be aware of and mm. um yeah and it was a very successful year for myself I scored a lot of points yeah um, which definitely caught the eye of um you know some pretty important people so that always helps and yeah yeah um yeah it was a great year and that that year um, earned myself a like a summer uh, full time contract. Right. So you 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 train throughout the summer with the NRL squad. Okay. So you're part you're part of the squad. So I got the invitation to do that um, yeah. following that first season. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely was a uh, a step up in your career, uh, and that obviously that extra step towards um, NRL uh, game time. Uh, so in the September of 2012, you were named in the Cup Team of the Year. Uh, what did you think when you'd uh, been recognised for all your hard work and efforts and, and now being named in the Team of the Year? Uh, it was that one, potentially that one thing that made you stand stand out above the rest. You've high point scorer, now Team of the Year in the Cup. Uh, in the cup. What was that like? It, it was good. It was a good personal goal um, mm. to achieve. Being named in that Team of the Year, it's not essentially the best players in that position. It's probably more or less the most consistent performers right, in that yeah. position throughout the entire season. Um, and that, that just showed my consistency um, throughout that first year and um, earned myself that, that spot in that team, which I was pretty stoked with at the, um, at the end of that year. It mm. uh, gave me that extra boost of confidence and it, um, yeah, it really, um, did well for me leading into that next, into that second year where I know I'm not the new guy on the block anymore. 
I need to not only do what I did in that first year, but also step it up a bit yeah. as well. So, yeah, um, yeah it, it just added a little bit more fire in the belly to, to make that next step. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely a, a brilliant personal goal and something that would boost your confidence, um, like you did say. Um, so you made your debut for the Newcastle Knights in the NRL, uh, I believe, round 12 against South Sydney. Uh, no doubt a big game. Uh, and you absolutely smashed it on your debut, I must say. Um, you scored a try and kicked three goals. Uh, finally, you've been given a chance at top level uh, and you've proved why you should be more involved uh, at the top flight. Uh, honestly, mate, after putting on such a such a top shift, you must have been you must have been absolutely ecstatic with your performance, uh, and just proud of where you've uh, where you've come from and where you are uh, at that moment in time. What was that day like for you? Yeah, it was um, it was a brilliant brilliant weekend. I remember pretty much everything about it. Um, right, it was I was twenty six. I was. I wasn't part of the actual full-time squad during the regular season. So okay. I'd finish the summer part and then I'd go back to training in the afternoons with the cup team. Yeah. Um, they called me in that week just to fill in for an injury on the wing. Mm. And then they called me in again a couple of days later. And then on the Friday was captain's run. Yeah. Um, they called me in again. Um, and I was, I filled in the wing again. And at the end of that session, um, uh, the coach, Wayne Bennett, he comes up to me and says, you're in. Yeah. And this was the day before the game. And I was keeping it together on the outside, but on the inside, yeah. I was yeah. pretty chuffed. I was doing backflips. Um, and that's all he said. He was so, so basic with his, um, with his instructions, with his words. Yeah. And he goes, by the way, you'll be goal kicking. I'm like, oh, cool. Yeah. No worries. <laughs> um, and then he walked off. So um, the fact that he told me the day before the game was a good thing. I yeah. didn't have a whole week to to mentally drain myself about it. Um, but the day of the game, we played at night time. It was in Sydney. Okay. It was really wet. Yeah. It was this time of year as well. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I got to score a try on debut, which was a bit of a surreal experience. I remember running out um, out of the tunnel and onto the field yeah. for the start of that game. And there was no nerves. It was just, I just thought to myself, finally, um, yeah. yeah, it's here. Make the most of it. You know, if I was 18, I'd probably be shitting bricks. But yeah. I was, I was 26 and yeah. um, a bit more mature. I could take it all in and, yeah, that it was a it was a great eighty minutes. Um, I really enjoyed it and um, came away with a couple of broken ribs. But right. that sort of it put me out for the next couple of games, so I didn't get to a chance to um, back up that performance next week. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, but no, it was a great experience. I couldn't have asked for a better debut, to be honest. Yeah, no. Would have been good if we won. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was definitely it was a uh, a brilliant debut. Um, yeah. And like you did mention, um, and I mentioned earlier, yeah, you made your NRL debut at 26, which is quite late on. Um, yeah. Do you think the reason why you made your debut so late is because you didn't really have the mindset of, um, this is what I want to do when I'm older, I'm going to be an NRL player, and instead you just played the game because you enjoyed it a bit? Do you think that's that's the reason why? Yeah, exactly. Um, early on... When I was 19, uh, playing in a local competition, mm. we, we got a new coach. And our new coach, he's, he had 150 NRL games under his belt. Right, uh, yeah. In full stringer. You know, he played with Parramatta and South Sydney and uh, the North Sydney Bears as well. And yeah, after a couple of games playing under him at the age of 19, he said, um, you know, I believe you could play in RL. And right. I remember I remember that just sort of shocked me and it kind of affected me. Right. Totally in a way. Um got into my head and he even told me that um he gave my name to the Newcastle Knights coach at that time, Brian Smith. Yeah. yeah. Um 
and then he might come to a couple of games throughout the year. And I was just sort of taking that all in and knowing he was going to be at one of my games, I and not playing one of the worst games I've ever played. Okay. Um, so I was probably mentally immature to receive that sort of information. It took me a few years to get in the right mindset yeah, of yeah. what needs to be done um, in order to get to that level. So, um, yeah, like you said, it's probably early on. It had to take me a few years to play at that lower level to get my confidence and then to, to boost it up into the top top grades. Yeah, um, that uh, sounds like uh, basically what I think of it as some people uh, enjoy the sport and have that mindset of wanting to go pro, but then you can just play the game for fun. Uh, and that's yeah. what you did. But because you were yeah. naturally gifted, so to say, you managed to play the game because you enjoyed it and also make it at that top level uh, and travel yeah. the world. Obviously, uh, obviously, you played for Hulk KR, which we'll mention in a, uh, in a minute. And obviously, you played in the NRL. So you managed to do it all uh, just by playing a game you enjoy, uh, which is brilliant. Um, so you re-signed uh, with the Knights uh, for a one-year deal, uh, I believe. And again, you were named yeah. in the 2013 Team of the Year. Uh, I'm sure you were pleased with that. But after having such an impact on your debut, obviously, you did mention uh, you came out with a few broken ribs. Uh, but you had such a good uh, Im- uh, impact uh, and a good debut. Uh, and I'm sure you were expecting to get a bit more game time uh, than you did in the NRL. Uh, why do you think you weren't given the chance uh, as much as you thought you maybe you should have deserved uh, to play a bit more in the NRL? Um, to be fair, we had two really, really good wingers um, in first grade. We had Akila Uate, who was playing for Australia at the time. Yeah. And State of Origin. Mm-mm. And James McManus, who was also uh, playing Origin on the other wing. So, um, didn't get much opportunity with those two um, pretty much playing full seasons. But then um, those two were the first two selected. Yeah. I was, I was sort of like the fourth string right, outside right. back. So, before me, the third string was Kevin Nagama, who's... Yeah. Yeah. over at St. Helens at the moment. Yeah. And um, for, for me to get that first debut, Uate was injured and Darius Boyd was on origin duty. Yeah. So yeah. Kevin Nagama filled in for Darius Boyd at fullback and then I filled in for Uate on the wing. So yeah. um, in order for there to be two outside backs missing for a game, it was pretty rare. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Especially that season and, um, yeah, unfortunately, that's the way things go. Uh, but, um, you know, I got, I got my opportunity and I, and I took it yeah. when I did. So, thankfully, I made the most of it. Yeah, um, definitely, mate. You definitely took that opportunity. Uh, and you did prove that you could play at top flight, uh, even though the opportunity didn't come as much as uh, you might have liked it to. Uh, but like you said, there were two class uh, wingers. And then, obviously, Kevin Nagama as well uh, in for selection. Um, so you did have a tough time maybe getting selected because there's brilliant talents there um, and you all have different aspects of your game which you can obviously um, provide uh, and put yeah. forward uh, onto the field. Um, but during that 2013 period, you were in a successful uh, Italian squad which qualified for the Rugby League World Cup, obviously. Uh, how proud were you that you could help take your Italian side to a World Cup, um, which is the pinnacle of international rugby league? Yeah, it was... Um... At the start of 2013, that was my my goal. Yeah, um, yeah. Obviously, to, to play NRL, be top points, go and make team of the year, all those sort of individual um, accolades. But at the end of the year, I wanted to be on that World Cup. Yeah. Um, in that World Cup team because I went away with them in 2010, 2011 for the qualifiers. Yeah. Um, and it was our first World Cup. You know, we had some great players. Yeah. Minicello brothers, Tedesco, La Frankie, yeah, Paul Vaughan. So we had a great team. And you know, to, to play we played Wales again in that first game. Yeah. In front of forty thousand people. Right. And um, it was great. It was so so good. It was a um really good tour. Um, it was our great it was a great sort of first initiation for Italy into the World Cup yeah. arena. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, no, I was, I was so proud. And my parents came over to watch me as well, so mm. they were wrapped. Yeah, they were stoked. Yeah, yeah, I bet they were, mate. Uh, so in the October of 2013, you played for the Italian side uh, against the England team, uh, in which you kicked yeah. the winning field goal uh, in it, in a Italian 15-14 victory uh, over England, uh, surely beating one of the world's best uh, international teams at the time. Surely that gave the Italian boys a bit of confidence to think, right, maybe we can we can do this at top level. Maybe we are that team to look out for, maybe the dark horses, so to say. Yeah, that that game was that was a it was a very um very physical game uh yeah. memory. Even though I was out in the wing, um out of the middle, uh we 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 absolutely gave it to them in that first half. Yeah. We 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 played our our strongest thirteen in that first half. Yeah. And I think we went into the break either twelve six up. Or right, maybe it would have right. been six all or something. Anyway, um, we came in half time. We're pretty confident. Yeah, but yeah, we took off all our all our main big name players, so to speak, uh, and we played the rest of our squad. Yeah, and um, I think I came off in the last five minutes. Uh, James Tedesco got a cramp or something, so I said, "Oh, right. I'll go back on." Um, and at this stage, it was 14 all. And yeah. I'm thinking, oh, if we can get close, I might give it a crack. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think Josh Charlie drops a, drops a, like a bomb 20 meters out. We get a scrum. I'm thinking, all right, I'll, I'll give it a go. And yeah. I've never kicked a field goal in my life. Right. Right. And, I, and I've never kicked one since. Yeah. So it's my one and only. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, two minutes to go, we were sort of near the post and, 10 metres out, I just I snapped a quick one in between Chris Hill and I think it was James Graham. Yeah. And um, it went over and uh, the, the party for the next two days was pretty, pretty special. Yeah, uh, it was a big I bet night. it was. Yeah. 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 It was um, unreal. Yeah, it's definitely um, a big, a big moment in the Italian national team history and obviously your personal uh, history in rugby league because like I mentioned, England, New Zealand, Australia, uh, no doubt the three best teams in the world, obviously Australia and New Zealand may be a bit uh, ahead of England, but those three best teams uh, in the world and this Italian side has come in and just give it their all and they've beat one of the world's best international teams. Like It must have been brilliant. Uh, so I understand yeah. that the partying would have been absolutely amazing. Um, do you think that running up to the World Cup, maybe a few people wrote Italy off even though they uh, beat a few... A uh, good team to have a few good performances. Do you think there wasn't really uh, a much pressure on Italy, and that's why maybe they were uh, performed as well as they did and uh, shocked a few sides? Yeah, like because we hadn't been in that arena before, probably no one really knew what we had to offer. Yeah, uh, we knew ourselves how good we were, um, the talent we we had at that that point, and just just from playing. In the early years, yeah, I was always just so proud of the, the way we um, we sort of stuck it to every team we played. Like, yeah, we didn't have the biggest team running out, but we all were always in it together, and we were, we were, we were like a tight knit yeah. group, like a bit of a family, and that was sort of like our our um, our motto, like you know, one family um, in Italian. Yeah. So. Um, going into that that friendly against England, I'm sure they they weren't expecting us to be probably that strong or that good, yeah, yeah. which I totally understand. Um, but, you know, in the press, they copped it that week after we beat them and they made a few big changes to their squad. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but yeah, for us, it was a good, sort of good confidence booster heading into the main tournament. Yeah, definitely, mate. Uh, so 2014, another year in the uh, New South Wales Cup uh, and another another year being named in the Team of the Year. Uh, at this point, was it a bit frustrating maybe that you weren't playing at top level? Uh, and were there any clubs maybe interested in your signature that you didn't pay as much attention to as maybe you could have uh, back then? Uh, who was who interested in your signature and why do you think you weren't getting that opportunity at top level? Um, 
first of all, I don't think anybody was interested in my right, signature. Right, right. I was a 27-year-old with yeah. two, two yeah. NRL games under my belt. So that, that third year at Newcastle, I was pretty much focusing on just um, playing really well for the, for the cup team. Yeah. Um, I, got, I got another game in NRL that year, but I failed miserably. I, it was a very poor game right. by my standards. Um, and I was so disappointed with it. But anyway, that's, that's the way it goes. But, yeah. Um, I went back to the cup team and I played really well in that second half of the season. Right. Scored a lot of tries and scored a lot of points. Um, but there was also a good young crop of outside backs right, okay. coming through the system as well. So, you know, these kids are 19, 18 with the world at their feet and I was yeah. 27. So it was only, yeah. and we weren't going very well at, at the time in our, with our NRL team. So um, it was only the smart option and they were better than me anyway. Um, yeah. To give them first crack at um, any position that came up. So, um I was resigned to the fact that that would be my third and last year at Newcastle. Okay. I ticked off every box that I wanted to. Yeah. Uh, so I was, I was happy just to go back to Wild and play, um, still playing the New South Wales Cup competition, but with my junior club. Yeah. The following year. Yeah. But then late, late on, um, whole KR came in with a bit of an offer. And yeah. Yeah. That's the next part of the story. Indeed, mate. And that's where we move on. Uh, the, the, then came the deal, like I mentioned, debatably the move that made you the player uh, you were known to be. You travelled across the world uh, to the Holy Land of the United Kingdom, you might say. Uh, you signed a three-year deal with OKR starting in 2015. Uh, a big uh, signing for you and the club. Uh, a new path, a new storyline. Uh, it was your time to get your name out there and prove what you can do uh, on a rugby pitch. Uh, what was it like touching down on English soil for the first time? And, you know, at that point, it's official. You'd moved to England. You're playing in uh, Super League slash championship level. Like, you're you're the you're the man now, pretty much. You are at that top flight. What was that like? Yeah, it was... Um, trying to think... I remember... I actually remember the plane flight. Uh, right. And landing. I had a shirt on. I had shorts on. I had flip-flops. Yeah. One of them actually broke. So I was actually walking barefoot right. one foot through the airport. Yeah. Um, our kit man, Bonesy, he was there to pick me up. Yeah. I just had to give him a hug because um, it was a long 24-hour flight. Mm. Um, but to, to land in England, um, it was it was so good to to sign a Super League contract yeah. first and foremost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I played in England the previous year with the World Cup. Yeah, um, yeah. I knew what the passionate and vocal fans were like, and I just wanted to experience that atmosphere every week. Yeah. Um, which you don't get in Australia at NRL level or at cup level, you know? like Right, yeah. You might get 20,000 at NRL games, but it's it's pretty quiet Yeah. compared to a 10,000 uh, Super League match. So Yeah, yeah. That was the that was the one thing I wanted to get involved in is to buy into the culture of the club that I was going to play for, mm. get amongst the community, make myself known to everybody, and play for play for them because um, they they're so passionate and they love their rugby. So yeah, um, yeah. No, it was easily one of the best career decisions ever, life changing decisions ever. Um, and I was, yeah, first couple of years of my life. Yeah, mate. Uh, obviously, I've seen you on uh, your social media, your Instagram stuff, always speaking about how how uh, good good of a time it was, the friends you've made, etc. Um, and obviously, you're always mentioning the good things about uh, playing in the UK. But what do you think was the hardest uh, thing you had to adjust to? Uh, moving from Australia to the UK, apart from obviously the weather, so because the weather's uh, obviously quite a bit different in the UK compared to Australia. But what do you think was hardest to adjust to? Um, to be to be fair, I didn't find anything hard to adjust to. Um, right, the weather I could deal with because I'm being paid good money. Yeah, to play a game I love. Yeah, yeah. And if I have to go out in the cold wet to train for one hour, so be it. 
Like, yeah. honestly, yeah, it is nothing. It's you know, I like because I made it. Yeah, as a 26, 27 year old, I know what it's like to to have a normal job, to work shitty hours. Yeah. So this was literally the dream. Yeah. Um, so yeah, nothing really was difficult. Um, okay. I didn't have time because everything was so new to me. Um, obviously, the leaving your family behind and your partner behind for a few months. Yeah. Um, that was difficult to adjust to. Mm. Uh, but because everything was new to me, it sort of took my uh, mind away from that stuff a bit. Um, yeah. And probably the hardest thing to adjust to actually was the style ah. of rugby. Yeah. that is played compared yeah. to over here. Um, it's much more free-flowing, less structure defensively and with the ball. So that was, it took me a good six to eight weeks to really find my feet yeah. in the Super League. Yeah. And, you know, my games probably show that. I, I wasn't really scoring many tries right. um, in that first six to eight-week period, but from then on, I sort of kicked off. Yeah, well, that actually um, leads me on smoothly to my next question. Uh, so having played in Australia and in the UK, uh, and I do ask this question quite frequently to players who have played on both sides of the pond, uh, what main differences did you notice in the style of play uh, in the English game compared to, uh, debatably, uh, or not debatably, the more uh, developed Australian game? Yeah, just probably those things that I just mentioned. Yeah. The, the structure... Especially defensively, it's it's very loose. When I say loose, it's it's um there's not as much wrestle, um, mm. time on the ground, that sort of uh, defensive side of things. Um, yeah, it's a lot more free flowing, and right, I think okay. it's a better brand of rugby league right. to watch. Uh, this is back back then when I was playing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Like the rugby league here in Australia now is a lot more free flowing because of the rule changes, and yeah, now we're seeing a lot of blowout scores and teams on the back foot. But yeah. in the Super League, um, it was kind of, yeah, a, a different uh, free-flowing brand of rugby. And yeah. That, that's why I feel outside backs going from Australia to England are more successful compared okay. and forwards when they go yeah. from England to Australia, yeah. they're more successful. So it, it's, it's a, weird sort of transition between the two yeah yeah um, yeah so i found that right um so obviously like you mentioned uh the games are a bit different uh it's not like they're a different sport uh but there also is those noticeable changes uh, in the game like you mentioned uh and yeah. you often mention that playing over in the uk living in england making friends for life uh over in the uk uh it's one of the best experiences uh, of your lifetime uh, what was it that really made uh, Hull KR hold a place close to your heart? Uh, it's the people. Uh, they welcomed me and, um, you know, when when fans and <clears throat> when there's so many people that uh, welcome you into their team, into their community, yeah. um, you know, you've got a big responsibility to play within yourself. Mm. Um to be the best player you can on the pitch every week. And that's what I tried to do. Um, obviously, every week, you don't always produce your best. But, yeah. Um, I tried to make sure that whenever I was out there, I, I, I did, did the best I could because yeah, there's yeah. thousands of people there paying a lot of money to watch you run around for 80 minutes and yeah. get footy. So, yeah, um, yeah it, it was definitely the people. Um going out in town whether i'm getting my shopping yeah or going out for a beer it's always good to have someone come up to you and say good day and yeah yeah welcome and um even had black and whites come over and yeah so say good day as well so um it's a good town good people yeah yeah you, you can tell that um definitely holds a place close to your heart which is uh, which is brilliant because it does show that you've just uh, got a passion for rugby league uh, and everyone has supported you uh, in your journey, uh, which is really good and it's what rugby league is all about. 
Um, so you scored your first two tries of the Super League campaign uh, against my team, Warrington. Uh, and on your debut, you kicked five goals. Uh, a brilliant start to your Super League career, even though you did say it started off a little bit. Not shaky, but you took a while to maybe get into the into the groove of things and find your rhythm. Uh, but a brilliant, yeah. a brilliant game uh, and a brilliant way to kickstart uh, your time uh, with Hull KR. Uh, tell us what it yeah. was like uh, kicking off the season uh, in such great fashion. Yeah, it was it was good. Um, round one was a sellout at home on a Sunday afternoon against Leeds, yeah. one of the biggest teams yeah. ever. Um, and I just remember it was so loud. The yeah, crowd. Yeah. Um, we started off really well. We we had a good lead uh, early in that second half, but you know the, the quality players like Sinfield and yeah, Ron Burrow yeah, just came to life. Um, you know, Callum Watkins. Um, you know, they, they ended up running away with it yeah. in the end. But you know, my memory from that game really just opened my eyes. It was it was a really quick game too. Yeah, um, I think. We were sort of running off the adrenaline from the crowd and Leeds sort of met up with us with that adrenaline and Yeah. It was a it was a good high quality contest. Um you know, we we, we only won one of our first four games. Okay. Um, you know, with the team that we had, it it wasn't the best start to our campaign, but it sort of took us a time to get into our groove a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, and against Warrington in round four, um, another top outfit that year. It was good to get a couple of tries and yep. kick a few goals and score some points that day. Um, that was probably one of my better games early in the year. Mm. Um, yeah, I just remember before before kickoff that day, I, I really wanted to have a big game. Right. Especially against a good, good yeah. outfit like Warrington. Yeah. So... Yeah, that were that were my memories of the first few weeks. Yeah, and what uh what good memories they are. Uh, whether you lost lost a few games, uh, you won a few games. You've still, uh, you know, you're playing Super League level. You've gone from cup, uh, cup level to all the way top tier uh in England uh for Super League, uh, which is just a brilliant story. Um, there were ups and downs uh at Hull KR, uh, but heartbreak uh for the boys in red did strike. Uh, and the Robins unfortunately did lose the relegation battle uh, and went from Super League to the, to the Championship. Uh, explain that heartbreak when you knew the boys were going down. Yeah, that was a um, that was a that was a weird season. Anything that could have gone wrong that year did. Yeah. Um, from a club and team perspective. Yeah. Yeah. With me personally, it was the most injuries I've ever had in a season. Right. Um, you know, I, I got a bad eye injury. I was out for six weeks. Second game back, I broke my arm. Yeah. In Derby. You know, out for four months. Um, you know, and then at the end of the year, I needed to get more reconstructive surgery. Yeah, yeah. Wrist and thumb. So for me personally, it was just one of those one of those seasons and yeah yeah the heartache you speak of that million pound game um yeah it was a it was a weird weird feeling um i i look back now and i, I think i felt like a dead man walking you know right. i think i knew deep down that it was probably uh, meant to happen mm. uh, it was probably a bit of a wake-up call for the club in a way um, you know, and that was five years ago and, and now five years later, the club's doing really well. You know, I've got some great signings there now and yeah, sitting, sitting in the middle of the Super League table, which is good. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's hard to say, but I think it was probably meant to happen. Right. Um, yeah, it was, it was a horrible, yeah, horrible experience, but. Um, that was my last ever game in a KR yeah. shirt, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and like you mentioned, although it was a heartache and, you know, you, the boys didn't want it ha to happen, 
do you think having that experience of then playing obviously you were it was your last game do you think then the team though having that experience playing a, a little bit of a lower level uh made the club stronger so then like you said now uh five years down the line or so uh a couple of years down the line uh, they're now performing very well at top flight. Do you think it was something that, uh, although at the time seemed like a down, actually it was uh, better for the club in the long run? Yeah. Um, how how it was better for the club, um, I, I probably assume um, with the relegation, obviously contracts disappear. Yeah. Yeah. So I think in a way the club could start fresh, with who they wanted, mm. the correct amount of money they were willing to spend yeah. on each player um, and probably manage their roster a little bit better. Um, and, you know, looking at the roster they have now, five years later, yeah, it's, it's built on, you know, a lot of, a lot of players doing their job and then bringing in some real, Real good superstars from overseas yeah. and from England as well. You know, to get Danny Maguire signature, to get Ryan Hall signature. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they're, they're huge. Um, you know, Ryan Hall is an absolute beast. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and as well as the Australian um, NRL contingent that's there at the moment, like Sean Kenny Dow and Corbin Sims. Yeah. Takarangi, um, yeah. You know, those players wouldn't be there now if it wasn't for the for the yeah that I know foundation what you mean. Yeah, yeah that the club had to go through again to build yeah so, yeah yeah I think it worked out down the track yeah definitely um so in 2017 uh although you did create your own legacy uh, over in the United Kingdom uh, and the hooky R fans definitely held you close to their hearts. Uh, and you really did make a mark uh, on the English game, uh, especially in the red side of Hull. Um, you decided to return to Australia uh, and play for what was then the Sydney Roosters feeder club, uh, the Wang Roos, which obviously you mentioned uh, you played for uh, back uh, back a, a bit early in your career. Uh, what was yeah. your decision to go back to Australia? Um, my decision to go back to Australia was I signed three years to play Super League. Right, um, right. I, I didn't want to be away from home another year playing championship mm -hmm. uh, rugby. I didn't think it was beneath me. I wasn't arrogant about it. I just felt the reason why I left Australia in the first place was to play yeah. Super League. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Uh, if I could not fulfill that for a third year, then best for me to come home yeah also financially it wasn't worth me staying another year as well yeah because the contracts essentially get torn up so mm -hmm. um you know those two reasons were the biggest right um, also i can come home and start my university degree yeah a year earlier than i planned so um which i've now finished you know, I'm, mm. I've now finished my university degree. If I stayed for that third year, I'd still be at university today. So yeah, yeah. I suppose silver linings at the end of the at the end of the day, but I'm I'm happy and content with my decision. Yeah, um, yeah. Am I happy that it was my last game in red? No, but I'm happy I got to play in red in the first place. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Yeah, that's the way it goes. Unfortunately. Yeah, mate. Um, I agree with your decision. Uh, and although some people may not have um been happy with it, and obviously you might have wanted to stay over. Uh, obviously it was the best decision. Uh, that you thought, uh, you should have made. Uh, it was the best decision. Uh, and like you said, uh, you're now a teacher, a qualified teacher, which is brilliant. Um, but before we speak a little bit about that, uh, I do want to mention uh the. Um, the couple years um, you had with the Wangaroos after leaving Hull KR. Um, yeah. So at the end of the 2018 season, I believe, um, I think it was decided that Sydney um, would uh, end their partnership with the Wangaroos uh, and they'd no longer be their feeder team. Uh, and instead yeah. they'd choose the foundation club um, 
uh, North Sydney as their new feeder side. Uh, obviously, yeah. it would have been something no one was looking forward to at the club. Uh, but do you think that uh, that decision was was coming one day or another? Um, we got told that decision at the start of 2018. Oh, right. Okay. So we had a full year to sort of get our heads around it. Um, it wasn't the Sydney Roosters' decision to to cut that relationship. It was more so the Wyong. Ah, okay. Um, end of the, the deal. Um, as players and even the coaches, we weren't happy with that decision. Mm. Um, yeah. We felt we were creating a good base for the, you know, the young Roosters players coming through to mm. develop their skills, to play at a good standard of rugby league. Yeah. So for them to move on into the NRL. And a lot of those players I played with in those two seasons, they're playing NRL today. Um, right. You know, Lindsay Collins, Paul Mogorowski. Yeah. yeah. Um, Nat Butcher. Mm-hmm. Matt Ikuvalu. You know, there's a lot of great players who were playing in that wild cup team to, to eventually go on and be permanent NRL players. So, yeah. Uh, and I knew that year that was probably going to be my last year of playing Okay. at that kind of level as well. So, um, yeah, we weren't happy with the decision that was made, but there was business, that's footy. And, yep. um, yeah, everyone just sort of went their separate ways after that season. Yeah, fair enough, mate. Um, so you've had success uh, on the international stage in Australia, playing at top level and at club level. Uh, as well as making your mark uh, in the UK. But is there a particular achievement uh, which stands above the rest for you? Sure. Um, personal achievement. Um, to get that NRL jersey was yeah. 26 years of hard work. Yeah. Uh, I, I think of that moment as probably one of the best moments. Ever in my yeah. life, I guess. Um, because I knew how much I had to sacrifice, how much I had to work right, in yeah. order to get it. Yeah. Um, so that was probably one of the biggest things, but also, um, you know, having two World Cups under my belt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's pretty cool to, to look back on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was hoping for a third this yeah. year but who knows what's going to happen mm. um and also you know playing playing a challenge cup oh yeah uh, yeah with the robins um you know those those challenge cup games were my favorite yeah to play in yeah uh, you know I, I, I always probably played my better games during those semi-finals and quarterfinals right yeah for the robins um during those games because i knew the enormity of, yeah yeah and the history of it um but um unfortunately we, we, we had one of our worst games ever in that final but mm. just probably to be a part of that run yeah yeah it really was yeah. pretty special um, yeah yeah especially that semi-final day in leeds mm. that was a um that was a huge day that was massive yeah definitely um a big day for you uh and you've had you've you've achieved quite a lot in your career um, so I'm sure you're pleased with yourself, uh, as you should be. Um, but since then, you have decided to hang up the boots and retire from professional rugby league uh, at that top level. Um, and you uh, you made your debut a lot later than others. Uh, and so yeah. therefore, your career maybe wasn't as long as it could have been uh, if you started at 18, 19, like you mentioned earlier. Um, yeah. How do you fell out with the game? Uh, or was it a decision that you knew would better uh, better your future uh, and benefit you more in the long run uh, to retire? Was it what was it that met, was the real uh, pushing pushing um, pushing uh, what what should we call it the 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 last uh, string almost? Uh, what was the final the final uh, decision uh, on why you should retire? Um. Well, to 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 finish up playing professional semi-professional mm -hmm. at the cup level um i knew you know being a 31 year old you won't get to play cup 
anywhere else, even if you wanted yeah. to. So yeah. um, I played 2019 last year and the start of this year in a local okay. competition in Newcastle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this year uh, would have been about probably 10 weeks ago now. Okay. Um, got injured again. Right. Um, she fractured my my throat. Okay. Um, which I had done previously years ago when I was with Newcastle. Yeah. Hence the voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I I fractured it again ten weeks ago, and okay. was in hospital for a few days. Mm-hmm. And the specialist pretty much said, "You're done." <laughs> right. Yeah. Don't play again. Um, yeah. You're a school teacher. You need your voice. Mm-hmm. Um, and your throat also is your airway to breathe. So yeah. that's also a pretty big risk. Yeah. So it was only um, right for me to officially hang up the boots yeah. uh, about yeah. 10 weeks ago now. So yeah, this would have been my probably my last year playing. Okay. Um, but uh, unfortunately, injuries. Yeah happen and that's the way it goes i guess yeah mate and uh obviously retiring was something that was better for you and you didn't want to risk it um and like you mentioned you are now a qualified teacher um how is that transitioning from um rugby league uh every day of your life to you know maybe what people call it as a proper job almost like you know uh working in uni to get that degree and then now obviously being a teacher how's all the uh, how's all of that going I, i love it um I work at a uh, a Catholic all boys school. Okay. Um, and they're rugby league fanatics. Um, yeah. You know the boys they love their footy, and uh, being an ex player, they they love yeah that side yeah. of me as well. So it does help build relationships. Yeah. Between me and my students in the classroom, um, it breaks that sort of ice a bit um mm. you know i i'm not a teacher that's finished high school gone into university yeah gone back into teaching yeah 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 high school i've, I've gone and lived a 10 12 year life full of all these stories and, yeah um meeting all these great people that i can take into my job now and yeah. pass on to my students um you know, the way my coaches would interact with myself or the players. Yeah. Just the way they manage big groups is something I've learnt and taken into the classroom yeah. as well. Yeah. You know, sort of that man management um, relationships as a group, individually with your students as well. So, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, from what I've learnt with all that kind of stuff, it's helped me with my transition into a career that i'm loving at the moment yeah and um you know i'm even coaching one of the school footy teams and right doing very well there as well and uh yeah it's great um like i said um if i didn't leave that year earlier from england maybe this would not be possible at the moment yeah. for me today so i'm very lucky yeah yeah definitely mate it sounds like uh it's brilliant uh, and that is it for today, mate. Uh, I've loved having this chat. Uh, but before we do finish off, uh, is there anything you'd like to say to anyone listening who might maybe want to make it in the world of rugby league one day? Um, just work hard. Mm. Um, sacrifice everything you need to sacrifice. You need to have discipline, resilience, commitment, and... Yeah, a lot of hard work. Um, for me personally, I didn't have any skill whatsoever. I was just a someone who loved enjoying. Yeah, I uh, loved playing rugby. Um, so I had to work very hard for the small taste of it that I got at that top level. Um, yeah, you know, just a little thing like goal kicking. Um, you know the the three, four hours a week at training at home Mm. is not what you see 
Yeah. Um, yeah. TV, you know, that, that's why I kicked three from three. That's why I kicked six from six. Um, yeah. You know, it's those little things that you need to get in order mm. in order for you to be, to be good. So, yeah, just make sure you're sacrificing the, the correct things, disciplined and you're committed and you can do anything. There we go. Uh, wise words from the man himself. Uh, thanks very much for joining us today, mate. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've enjoyed every minute uh, of our chat uh, and hopefully I can get you on the podcast uh, later on down the line. Uh, once again, thanks for joining me. Uh, I wish your career and teaching all the best and I wish you a speedy recovery um, with the injury uh, and hopefully we can have a, another good chat again soon. Cheers for joining us, mate. Thanks again to our podcast partner, Recovery, for sponsoring today's episode. Head over to recovery.com to check out their range of all natural products and remember to use the code DROPGOAL in all capitals, no space, at checkout for 10% off your order.